y'all, I think, I think we have a quorum and I do have an hour's worth of material, or at least I hope we do, or I think we do. Uh, and so I ought to get started. I think I know everybody in the room. There are five of you all that I don't think I know, but I'm actually, I do know you, David and okay. Um, and yeah, you guys, glad to meet you. So I, I'm, I've been a member here for a while and I, this has become, uh, as you come in, grab two file cards and a pen. This is a participatory view. Terry, you look great. Thanks. Thanks for coming. So, but I, I so this is a three part series. Uh, we're going to, we're going to try to answer some questions here. And I think there are six that most people are worried about, which is what is happening? What's the extent of it going to be? What effects can we see? What can we expect in the future? What does our faith tell us about this and how should we react? Uh, how actions do we take? And then probably the most important thing is the last one, which is that there are significant barriers in the way of us doing things about it, both socially, personally, and technologically. So as you come in, grab a couple file cards and a pen. Uh, that'd be great. And just to you all that came late, we're we're just talking about the, the six questions we're going to try to look at over the next three sessions. So uh, today, tomorrow, or rather next Sunday, and on August the night, same time, same place, stay tuned. Uh, and what I'm going to do is that there are other people that have better speaking skills than I do, particularly Catherine Hayhoe and Trish Tall. And I'm, we're going to use them do videos, then I'm going to ask you to react to it, and then we'll have a short discussion on each of three points. Uh, hopefully those discussions, I'll try to limit it to five to eight minutes. Uh, so today, we're going to talk about what's happening and what our faith tells us. Next week, we'll talk a little bit of a review of what went on today, and then we'll answer the questions on what we can do at a personal level, and what we can do, because we can't do this by ourselves. Each of us acting individually, collectively together in that kind of behavior is not gonna fix this. Uh, and then on August the 9th, we're gonna review sessions and then certain things that stand in our way. Yes, sir. Well, it'll be, let's see, nine. I don't know why I put all this nine down there. I'm dyslexic. I reverse nine and six all the time. So, so, so the first thing that we're going to do today is I want to watch three clips from Catherine Hayhoe. We're gonna, she's going to tell us what the science is. And I guess I'm going to try. Okay. What effects do we see? And then the last part of this will be what our faith tells us. Uh, let me just tell you a little bit about her. Does anybody know who she is? Because I can skip this. Uh, that's awfully loud. Uh, that's good. Okay. Uh, she's a chief scientist for the Nature Conservancy. Uh, she's a professor of atmospheric science at Texas Tech. Uh, she's a principal investigator for uh, the National Academy of Science and Engineering and Mathematics on Climate Change, as well as the National Science Foundation and the Department of Interior's work. She's lead author on two of the most important climate change publications. One is from the National Academy of Science and Engineering, and the other is the National Science Foundations. Uh, she typically has been the lead author on the major report about how climate affects the United States uh, and what the prediction for that will be, as well as being the section leader on the international planetary, uh, governmental planetary for climate change group that provides a report every three years, scientific advisor to multiple organizations. And I want you to point out to you that she is an evangelical Christian her husband is a pastor of a church in Texas, in Lubbock, where they live. 
and has been an advisor to various faith groups that you can see here. She's authored 150 papers, numerous books, and frankly, is one of the best communicators I've ever seen. So the first thing we're gonna do here is I want to put two video clips back to back. I want you to watch them. And then uh, after that, I want you to sit and we'll ask some questions. Um, um, but before I start that, I, I threw these in just at the last moment before I came over here. I don't know if any of you all get uh, Microsoft Networks daily reports that flit across your Windows machine. How many of you all do that? Okay, well, this appeared. Uh, and I actually would like him to go back and, uh, sorry. And it, it, one of them was that uh, today is probably going to be the hottest day on earth ever recorded in Death Valley. Uh, I mean, not just in Death Valley, but in uh, on on Earth. And what's interesting is that the record that will be recorded is predicted to be almost two degrees higher than the previous record. Now, I don't know about you, but most of the time, if I think that an all-time record is going to be broken, it's going to be like a tenth of a degree, two tenths of a degree, or something like that. That's two degrees. So the point of all this is that increasingly records that are broken that define extreme climate are being broken at levels that no one has ever seen and by magnitudes that are unprecedented. And in fact, if, I also found this little video clip, which I took a photo shot on the right of, the, of, a, of a weather announcer from the San Francisco Bay Area. Now, do you all know where Truckee, California is? Okay, it's in the Sierras. You drive up I-80, you get to the top of the Sierras, it's like 6,500 feet where the Bronner Pass is. Notice that they have a heat advisory. This is 6,500 feet in the air. And they're telling people with disease, it's not a good idea for you to be walking outside. So that gives you another idea. These are extremes that we haven't seen before. And then while you're, listening to these first two video clips, I want you to, to think about these three questions, thus the file cards I gave you, because I'm gonna ask you at the end of them to spend two to three minutes and, and answer all of these. And the questions are, how concerned are you? And I'm going to ask you to rate that on a six point scale from you're alarmed to you don't think anything's happening with varying degrees of words in between. I want you to think about how has it affected you personally? Because we're gonna find out that even though a lot of people may think that something's going on, they don't think it's gonna affect them. And that's very true as we'll find out later on when we deal with what our faith says, because those of us who are well-to-do are going to be protected and those that are not well-to-do are not. And then finally, I want you to think about the question of how do you think it's going to affect your children or your grandchildren? Okay, so I'm going to ask Alec here to to to, to go ahead and, and get us started here. And then we're going to play these two videos in a row. And they're clips from a presentation that she gave um, uh, promoting her book entitled A Climate for Change. Um, that was written in 2014. Uh, subsequent to that, she's published a book entitled Saving Us, which is a far better book. And those of you, how many of you all may have read it? The book's entitled Saving Us, it was published in 2021, I believe. I highly recommend it. I highly recommend it because she talks about science, she talks about what our faith tells us. She does exactly what I'm doing in this series. So, okay, thanks, Alex. So we're gonna listen to Dr. Dr. Catherine Hayhoe shares her answers to questions that people of the Christian faith often have about climate change. My name's Catherine Hayhoe and I'm a climate scientist. I study what climate change means to us in the places where we live. So often when we think about climate change or global warming, we think it's about the polar bear or about people who live on low-lying islands in the South Pacific far away. But the reality is climate change is already affecting us right here where we live, and that's why it matters. 
Our book came out of our personal experiences. My husband pastors an evangelical church here in West Texas. And as soon as people started to find out what his wife did, they started to ask questions. Most people would ask him the questions because they didn't want to be rude. They didn't want to come up to the pastor's wife and say, how can you believe in this climate change earth worshiping religion anyways? So instead they went to my husband and they asked him questions like, how do we know it's not just a natural cycle? Or if God's in control, why would we care? Or aren't those scientists just making it up? And so he would come to me and he'd say, hey, I got a good question today. And I'd say, well, I don't know the answer, but let's look for the answer together. And then he would go back and give it to the person. He got so many questions that we started to feel like that we need to give people a resource. But when we looked around, there were a lot of great books about climate change, make no mistake. But those books didn't start where the people that we're surrounded with here in West Texas are. Those books started with the, the idea that, yes, we agree the science is real. Now we're going to explain the science and the impacts and why it's important. But many of the people that we talked to weren't even sure that the science was real. So we wanted to write a book that would answer people's questions starting in the place where they're at because they're good questions. They're questions that we should be answering. How do we know this thing is real? Why do we think it's humans for the first time instead of just natural factors? Why do we think the impacts are serious? And most importantly, what can we do about it? We know that climate has changed in the past due to natural factors. Changes in the Earth's orbit around the sun, volcanic eruptions, changes in energy from the sun, and even natural cycles inside the Earth's climate system like El Nino. They all affect our temperature, our rainfall, and more. But we know that today, according to natural factors, we should be getting cooler, not warmer. Instead, we are getting warmer faster and faster. And the only reason why the planet could possibly be warming today is not natural cycles, it's not the sun, it's the fact that every time we burn coal and oil and gas, we're producing carbon dioxide, a very powerful heat-trapping gas. That heat-trapping gas is building up in the atmosphere, effectively wrapping an extra blanket around the Earth, a blanket that we did not need. And so just like if you're sleeping and somebody sneaks into your room and puts an extra blanket on you and you wake up sweating saying, hey, I didn't need this blanket. In the same way, the earth is heating up because of this extra blanket that we're wrapping around it. And that is what we call human induced climate change. We know. So when people finish this book, I hope they will realize, first of all, we know that climate is changing. If we look around just in nature, we see over 26 and a half thousand indicators of a changing climate. Don't trust the thermometers, don't trust the satellites, we can throw them out. All we have to do is look in our own backyards to see how trees are blooming earlier. Insects and birds and animals are moving forward. The seasons are shifting and becoming more variable. The weather is just getting weirder. We can see this now in the places where we live. The second thing I hope people will go away with is, you know, we climate scientists take this very seriously. We don't, you know, just jump on the bandwagon and start screaming, it's got to be humans the first time we see climate changing. No, we look very seriously at all the other reasons why climate has changed. Could it be the sun? No, because the sun's energy has been going down the last few decades, not up. Could it be volcanoes? No, because volcanic eruptions actually cool the earth down. All of those little particles they produce act like an umbrella reflecting the sun's energy back to space. Could it be natural cycles like El Nino? Well, all those cycles do is move heat around the Earth's system. Those cycles can't create heat. All they can do is move it from the ocean to the atmosphere and back again. So if the atmosphere were getting warmer and the ocean were getting cooler, then we would know it was a natural cycle. But no, the atmosphere is warming and the ocean is warming even more. And then lastly, people say, well, couldn't we just be getting warmer after the last ice age? Actually, the warming after the last ice age peaked about six to 8,000 years ago. And since then, we've been in a very, very gradual, long, slow slide into the next ice age. Yep, the next event in our geologic calendar, sometime in the next thousand years or so, would have been another ice age. And then the third thing I hope people will recognize is, the impacts are serious and they matter. 
it isn't just about the polar bear, it isn't just about future generations. We are seeing changes now and here today in the places where we live. Whether it's sunny day flooding along the eastern seaboard, whether it's stronger hurricanes like Hurricane Harvey, where an estimated extra 40% of rainfall fell during Hurricane Harvey because of a warming planet. A hundred years ago, would we still have had a Harvey? Yeah, I think so. But it wouldn't have been as big or as strong and we wouldn't have had as much rainfall associated with it. In the West, we're seeing larger and larger areas burned by wildfires. Wildfires are still occurring at about the same rate they used to, but when it's hotter and drier, they can burn a lot bigger area. We're seeing property values in high-risk locations, especially along the coast, they've already dropped 7%. In California, a friend of mine called her insurance company because her insurance had gone up 30%. And she said, I've never made a claim. Why is my home insurance going up 30%? And the insurance company said, well, it's because your insurance is subsidizing all of the other risks that people are confronting, not just across the state, but around the country. In some places in Minnesota, their flood insurance and their home insurance has gone up not just a few percent, it's gone up over 100, sometimes even 200 percent because of the increase in flood risk. Farmers Insurance sued the city of Chicago for failing to adequately prepare for the impacts of a changing climate and leaving farmers insurance to pick up the bill. We are seeing impacts everywhere that we live today and that's why we care about a changing climate. And then the last thing I hope people will leave with after reading So, if you would, having had that introduction, uh, take your file cards and over in the next three minutes, uh, you, you know, look at these three questions. I'd like you to answer them, and then I want to engage in a discussion about it. So, be prepared to share if you would, okay? And Eli, I don't think you have cards, but Anybody else not have file cards? My wife. Do you have a pen? No. Well, you're going to have to. We're going to do this twice. No good. Uh, another minute, or is everybody done? How many people are done? How many people want another minute? 45 seconds now. Okay, good. Well, I think we'll start. Okay, so how concerned are you? Now, there's a six-point scale I've given here. How many people don't think anything's happening? Well, just by your presence here, I'd kind of figure that that'd be correct. Uh, how many people are, are like in the middle here? They say, yeah, something's happening, but I'm not quite sure it's a big deal. How many people think that way? So everybody in this room, then, is in the alarmed or concerned category. 
Okay, more about that in a second here. And in fact, I'll, I'll go, go right ahead and go on to that. Uh, the Yale uh, Climate Change Communication Group at Yale University, every year and a half to two years, conducts a survey of the United States. This one was done approximately a year and a half, two years ago. Uh, most people in the United States, the majority now think that it's real and a significant number are alarmed or concerned about it, about uh, 58 to 60 percent. Uh, and this sort of belief amongst Americans is a change over the last decade. Um, the people who think that global warming is happening outnumber the who's that it don't is 76% to 12%. And a majority of people who think that it's very concerning outnumber those that don't think that there's a problem by a factor of about uh, 10 to 1, 6 to 1, excuse me. 60% uh, of Americans that believe that climate change is primarily human caused, 40% think that environmental factors, which he's just disproved, are important or the most important thing. However, what's really interesting is the number of Americans who think that climate scientists say that this is happening is only at 60%. And yet, if you look at what people think or climate scientists say, surveys of them say it's greater than 99%. And the second thing is that only 25% of Americans believe in that consensus, that greater than 90 to 95 to 100% of climate scientists say, this is real, we've caused it, we gotta do something about it. Now that's astounding. And we, in the third session, will explore perhaps why that is. Uh, I have my own feelings about it. There are numerous things that could be creating that. Um, and it's led to, at least among the people that are left of center of this country, to castigation of the oil companies for their participation in this, which has been a significant part about it. Those of you that would like to go to the Yale survey themselves and read more about that, the URL is at the bottom of this. And it's also on one of these three, uh, it's actually on the um, resources that we have that you can access it as well. So let's go back to the second question. Has it affected you personally? How many people have been affected by climate change? Can you tell us a story? Okay, anybody? Anybody want to tell their? No, sorry. That's correct. And I, I Mary and I were. I don't want to say victim, but we experienced that both in 2010 and in 2017, which led me to go and look at the National Weather Service data from 1980 to 2018 when I did it, or 17 when I did it. I think I did it in 19. And if you looked at rainfall patterns defined as rainfall greater than an inch, rainfall greater than two inches, if you look at greater than two inches, the amount of rain or days on which two inches of rain fell or greater had increased almost 80% when you compared 2000, 1980 to 2000 versus 2000 to 2019. So, and the amount of increase for one inch was less than that, like 35 or 40%. Those of you that are statisticians don't need a statistical test to tell you that that's, and actually it's not the right analysis, but it, you get the idea. So who else? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And and if I was just uh, two days ago, I was just talking to a friend of mine who's from actually he's from Australia that has relatives that live in Minneapolis, in Minnesota. And they used to have three or four cross country skiing outfits in Minneapolis, you know, because it snowed. They're out of business. 
they don't have a business anymore. So I mean, we can argue about the relative value of cross-country skiing businesses because there are a bunch of other stuff we need to worry about. Who else? Yeah. Okay. It is too hot. And in fact, if you look at the health effects of climate change, what may not be as important as the overall temperature that you get to during a day, but it's the fact you don't cool off at night. So there's no chance for recovery. And that, that works on, that is an incredible distressor to most biological systems, both fauna and flora. I'm sorry, George, did you have your hand up or? Yes, there is. There's, Anybody ever, anybody ever heard of wildfire smoke from Canada invading the, <laughs> the United States? Does that ever happen? <laughs> it has not been reported in our lifetime. I've looked, my lifetime, 70 years, never before. It, I, I mean, I couldn't find, I went back to, you know, looked around. Yeah, go ahead. You Google it, you can't find it. Go ahead. Yeah, okay. The, the number of tropical cyclones probably has not changed. And climate modeling suggests that the number won't change. But their intensity? And, and part of the problem with that, if I keep going on like this, we're not going to get to what we the other part of this today. But but the other part of this is that the rapid intensification of the storm that occurs because they kind of buzz along you know over oh, their category two today they're like category two tomorrow well now you they're category two one day 14 to 16 hours later they're category four and if you look at that and it has to do with the number and increase in frequency of very warm spots of, at least in the Atlantic basin for very warm spots of water in the Atlantic, uh, the Atlantic uh, Caribbean basin, you know, where hurricanes go. So, okay. So, do uh, you think this, let's get to the other question about the final question here. Do you think it's going to happen? It's going to affect, is it going to affect you? How many people here think it's going to affect them? Some people do. You affect your children. Are you worried about your children? I certainly am. One of the reasons why I'm in this is that we have a grandchild. Her world will look completely different in my estimation. Those of you that say that you won't be affected, why did you, you didn't raise your hand. Did you raise your hand or you did You don't think it will be affected? Okay. How many people think that? You think it, you as well think that that you're young enough that it won't profoundly affect. Okay, so the the answer is, it, it, I'm sorry, from, from what I just heard you say, it's that yes, it will, but it won't be a catastrophe for me. Is that is that what you said? Okay, and and that could be because of where we live. I mean, you know, we got resources. We're in good shape. Yeah. Great, perfect. That leads into the last section that we'll talk about here in a minute. So uh, it's interesting that over time, over the last uh, 12 years or so, 13 years, 14 years, it, the people that say how, whether it will affect them have increased. If you've done this survey in 2009, that, only 30% of Americans would have agreed with that somewhat. And the number of people that disagreed with it would have been a ratio of two to one. Now they're approximately equal. It may be because of where they live. It may be because they think they're economically insulated. It may be because of any other reasons you can think of. 
we've talked about economic, we've talked about, uh, I'm not going to get, uh, you know, I'm 75, I don't think I'm going to live 25 years. Go ahead, George, what else? The science and government will take care of us. Okay, there are, there are really bright people out there that are working hard on this and they're going to save us. Okay. Huh? Wishful thinking. Well, it's kind of interesting if, if the notion that you brought up, if I'm alarmed about it, I should do something about it. But the majority of Americans think that if, if, if that it's not going to happen to me and it's going to happen to somebody else. They think that people who are impoverished are going to happen. And we'll get to, Hank, I'm with you. I want to do something about it. That's why I'm talking to you all, by the way. All right. So this is kind of part of doing something about it. Uh, but if you look at this far right here, that, that future generations of people uh, are going to be much more harmed than I am. So this kind of inhibits our ability as a group to interfere that. I'm not speaking to the pop the sample of the population that I'm talking about and talking to in this room. I'm talking about in general. It, yeah, do you agree with me or love, love your neighbor? There's, You know, one thing that keeps me up at night is this graph. You know, this was done and reported in uh, Nature Climate Change in 2020, and it was part of input to the IPCC report. And it, any, does this graph look weird to you guys? A little weird? You know, it's not, you know how it's supposed to be a bell shape? Part on the right is supposed to look like the part on the left. Well, that isn't true, is it? Notice that if you look at the mean, the most likely, it's about three degrees or a little over, 3.2 degrees centigrade, which for those of you, that's about a seven degree rise if you look at, not quite seven degrees, but it's almost a seven degree rise over on average. But look at the right-hand side of this curve. It's There's a lot more to the right than there is to the left. And so, there's a 15 to 20% probability of very, very high temperatures, ones that most people would, at least by the sniff test, say, well, this is civilization ending. Human species may survive, but we're going to look like what we did. Under, well, who knows what we're going to look like. But if you look at this, temperatures above four degrees, which is nine to 10 degrees Fahrenheit higher, eight and a half, nine degrees higher, there's a 15 to 20 percent probability of those temperatures, which most people think that the vertical axis is essentially what you do to, to generate this graph is to take a climate model that takes all the known inputs and you run it for a week and you generate about 12,000 different outputs combining all 14 variables that can have impact on that. And so 12,000, well, they did more than that. I can't tell you, the, it's unbelievable the cost of running one of these things to generate this graph. It's very expensive. It takes, it takes, something, uh, it takes something that Oak Ridge does to try and model nuclear bombs or something like that, but it's a profound amount of computing power required to put this together. And to answer your question about effects in the future, this graphic, came from the International Panel Report from this past one that was released in 2022. I say, yeah, that's about right, because it was in time for the last uh, COP20 or COP conference. And notice that we remarked that we're 70, probably not going to affect us very much. But look, if you were born in 1980, or especially if you're a child born in 2020, under even the very low scenarios, an increase in temperature is going to occur that's going to have profound effect under any of the climate scenarios that you can generate. So any comments before we move on to what our face says? Just kind of wanted to throw that out there before we, yes, you are. Uh,
I'm sorry now. Correct. Yeah. So you're asking what's the best chance of, of reality? And the answer to that question is unknown. Okay? Depends upon what we do. You know, I've got a let me just flip through it all the way to the end, yeah. Okay, and this speaks to exactly what you just said. This was actually, this is on Catherine Hayhoe's website. And she says, we basically have three choices. We can stop what we're doing. We can mitigate carbon dioxide emissions. We can adapt. You know, we're pretty clever. There's a lot of, a lot of stuff going on all the time. I read something virtually every day about some new innovation that's probably not going to get to market in time, okay? Because, you know, not only do you have to do the innovation, you got to, you got to put it in and implement it, okay? I'm sorry? Oh my gosh, you just wouldn't believe. I, I work for Citizens, I work for, I, I'm a volunteer for Citizens Climate Lobby and the, one of the biggest thing that we are, attempting to advocate for at this moment is permit reform, permitting reform. And this is a bipartisan thing. You know, believe it or not, the Republicans don't want to do it because they want, because they've been bought. I shouldn't say that. They're, because they, they, they as a group are advocates for the oil and gas company, more so than Democrats are. But Democrats want it because they want clean energy implemented as quickly as possible. If we don't do that, you, you, you all know the Inflation Reduction Act. Everybody familiar with that? Who's not? It, it, it put an awful lot of tax incentives in place and government uh, startup programs for clean energy. But the group that I volunteer with, Citizen Climate Lobby, say, you know, we're, we would only implement half of that over a period of time, unless we do permit and reform. We don't, we don't fix that. So if, one thing, if you wanted to do it today, just how many people on some regular, and George, I'll get to your question in a minute, okay? How many, how many people on some regular basis just email their senator or how many people are in Oglis' district? Andy Oglis's? You are? Okay. How many people? I'm asking the question, how many of you on a relatively regular basis email your Congress, your congressional delegation? How many people do it? No, I do. I do it at least once a month. I would urge you to do that and just put in one line. Permitting reform is being debated in Congress. I am in favor of it. Now, it doesn't tell you what bill to advocate for. There are about seven or eight of them. Our, the group I volunteer with likes ones that are bipartisan because they'll stick and have a chance of passing. Those that are advocated by, what's her name? The Congresswoman from New York City, AOC or whatever her name is, they don't have a prayer. And the one from, uh, the guy from Colorado doesn't have a prayer, but it, the, the ones that by, have bipartisan support have a prayer. So uh, I, I guess what we ought to do is just, we got about, what do we got? We got about 15 more minutes. Let's talk about what our face says. Um, yes, Hank.
Oh, they really will not be immune. They will really not be immune because of where they are geographically. So why would the developed country not rely on the West to subsidize the commission? Like, so while they might have the US might turn that out, but are we, I don't know, are we willing to take the same way cost, not even dollars, but like, are we prepared to imagine that we start with nothing, you know, which is, I actually heard three things in your comment and question, and I'm not going to eliminate, enumerate all that I heard, but one of them I heard is the free rider problem. What are you going to get? What are you going to do to get China? The CO2 is easily diffusible. I mean, they admit a kilogram of carbon dioxide. That kilogram affects me. How do I get them to stop doing that? And there is a solution to that. And I, I'm not going to get into that now, but there's a way of doing it. If you want to hear about that or read about it, I highly recommend that you pick up a copy of William Nordhaus's book, Climate Casino. Casino. Casino, as in Las Vegas. Okay. And he says that for a reason, entitled that William Nordhaus, Climate Casino. And it deals with that and how you go about getting rid of free riders. It does, it deals with a whole lot more, but it does in 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 great detail go over that particular problem. And I'm not going to get into that. We may talk about it at the third session. Yes, George, you'd said something and it raised your hand, and I it, then this line of discussion occurred. Correct. How many people? How many people in here want to embrace their inner windmill? Inner windmill. Inner windmill. Suppose, I mean, there's a little hill over here, right? Suppose some uh, some you're not going to put that up there because it's economically nonsensical because there's enough wind. But suppose a windmill went in, say, down there in uh, Belmead, you know, the Belmead Shopping Center. I live in Sugar Tree. I'm going to ride by it every day. Is that going to bother you? Oh, it, it, well, you're you're not saying because you believe that, but you're saying it because people say that, right? Well, that if you look at the larger ones that spin very slowly, the the deferred death rate is 
you know, how do I know that? I just, some trivial, it's kind of like cocktail facts, you know, fun facts to tell people cocktail parties. But, but the answer to that question is the, the newer designs have mitigated that considerably. Maybe yes, maybe no. Okay. Maybe yes, maybe no. Gosh, I wish that the promises of nuclear energy that was promised now 55, 60 years ago, when there was a rapid build out of Three Mile Island. Okay. Now I'm getting into why it didn't work. There's an awful lot of that that's an incredible history but at any rate the answer is that there are alternatives that will come to market um that being one of them hopefully and and and, and the answer is there will require technological breakthrough and they will require governmental assistance to, to scale them to bring them to scale so the answer is that there are solutions the question is scalability to deal both with increase in demand. You know something? Everybody in this room gets their power from TVA. Okay. And then the second thing I'd ask you to do is, I don't know how you get a hold of the TVA. I've, I've asked you now to email your congressman. That's easy. You go to the website, you put it in there. Some intern, some intern reads the damn thing and you never get a letter back. That's that's the way it is. Okay, but at least you've You've done the thing like voting. A bunch of you doing that changes the, and, but at any rate, the other thing to do is ask TVA. I don't know, how do you ask TVA? I mean, how do you get them on the, three directors, okay? And you write to the board of directors and say, why doesn't TVA have a meaningful energy efficiency program in place to encourage, what? That's correct. There's, that's interesting. They just, that Biden finally got his nominations through the Senate. Partly it's, yeah, but the point is you write to their board and say, you know, TVA does not have any meaningful way that you can, uh, suggestions on how you can upgrade the efficiency of your home, your power consumption. They just don't do it. Yeah, George. Pay for what? Oh no, no. These are these are meaningful. They can at very least at this point, because of the Inflation Reduction Act, promote. That's all I'm asking them to do is promote. That's correct. And that's what's insulated TVA from taking ownership of this problem. Okay. They've depended upon their local power producers to do it. And in fact, power generation in this country is another fascinating topic. But they, there, there's been an economic reason for that. Heretofore, the tax breaks, which have been in the tax code for a long, and George, I think you probably may or may not you have a better feel for this, apply to private companies. So anytime TVI wanted to put in a solar project, they had to partner with somebody like Ford or Vanderbilt or someone that can obtain a tax advantage to take advantage of it. They themselves now with the Inflation Reduction Act, that's not true. And oh, by the way, they are not prepared because they've never ever had to have an actuary try to figure it out. Maybe they ought to hire George, you know, to... Uh, you know what I'm saying? To, yeah, go ahead. Correct. Correct. It's Again, it's you were talking about barriers. You were talking about barriers and solution. 
this is a social economic barrier to solutions. That's an example of it. Again, George. Right. Correct. So, um, and so this on the front end of how much what was the last quote I showed you there? How much more pain do you need to endure before you're willing to accept the cost? And that also speaks to the most important economic question is that our emission of CO2 and the combustion of fossil fuels, we don't pay the full cost of it. We don't. There's no tax on carbon emission. So if there was a tax, you know, I, I, a friend of mine and I, who is a retired nuclear engineer from Oak Ridge, you know, she and I volunteer with us, and we, we have now analyzed two environmental impact statements that, T, that TVA has generated with regard to their replacing their coal fire plants. And I can tell you that if you look at the economic part of it and incorporated a meaningful tax on carbon emissions, this would change their economic analysis considerably and they'd be out buying land to try to put a solar farm in. You know, even a, a small one, relatively small one. So. And that's because they're getting old. And it, it, it part of that is that the, well, we can get into the nuances of that. I don't mean to have a, a discussion that's going to, you know, something we were going to talk about faith based stuff, but uh, we didn't even get there, did we? I think it's, is it, I guess it's about time. What? Okay. Um, anybody, uh, about four Sundays ago, Will Gelman came here. Did you all attend? Did you attend the session with him? He, he got into what the Hebrew words were for, that come from Genesis. If you read about this, it's this passage in Genesis. The end of the first chapter, it's in chapter one of Genesis, and there are uh, appropriate other stuff in Deuteronomy and a couple other places. But the word that that uh, that dominion, which has been used by many as uh, oh, oh, dominion it, 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 in the way that we conceptualize it or define it is different from the way the people that wrote this text would define it. And they use the word rada. Hayho gets into discussing what that means. And it's the idea that, that we are caretakers. That's the sense that the Hebrew word means. This has been entrusted to us. It's a covenant or to take care of it. Um, and that's the word rada means in, in Hebrew. And the, the second idea that she talks about is how we view our relationship with the environment. Uh, do we think it's egocentric? We're at the top, everything else below. Because the, the hierarchy implied in Genesis suggests that. You know, we're at the top, everything's below us, we have control, we're a benevolent, we're a benevolent monarch. Or we're benevolent monarchs, or, or you know what I'm saying, okay? Is it ego ecocentric? Uh, we're no better or no worse 
in terms of intrinsic value than the creation in which we live or theocentric do we have a special role in our relationship to care for it and that's the idea that the hebrew guerrero grotta means um oh. what was i going to say here okay that's basically it and then we we're going to get into the idea that the people that are going to suffer the most with this are the people that have had the least amount to do with it. Um, what do you think the subsistence farmer in sub-Saharan Africa is doing with all this? How are we going to help them? Uh, in this one film, she says, well, climate change is like a hole in their bucket that we continue to try and fill to improve the poverty situation. But that hole is getting so big now that there's nothing that we can do, at least in a meaningful way, unless we solve this other problem. That's one theme that she has. Um, and the, and the, the second theme is that, is that the least, you know, like, let's see, the, I produce about a ton of carbon dioxide um, per year driving my, my car. Okay. You actually produce about a ton and a half in yours. Okay. You, you, have, you know, her car didn't do as well as I do. Put that in perspective. Me just driving my car produces about four times the amount of CO2 that the average person that lives in sub Saharan Africa. Okay. That's just me driving my car. That doesn't include me buying electricity from NES. That doesn't include my. Well, that's another thing. Uh, we can get into the, the particular climate CO2 warming effects of air travel. They're far greater than... Okay, a good rule of thumb. I'll just, I better shut up here. Okay, we're at 1045. Uh, but but, but the, a good rule of thumb is that one person driving their car... Uh, driving their car by themselves for a 500 mile trip, okay, it will produce as much carbon dioxide as you being in an airplane making that same 500 mile trip. Now that is the average American car. I assume you drive, you thought you were astounded at that, weren't you? Okay, that's about the same. Now, if you fly a thousand miles, the amount of carbon dioxide you produce is far greater They're for reasons that are unclear. And if you fly a distance, yeah, okay. Uh, actually, it's the reverse. It's the other way. Less than 500 miles, you produce less than if you took an airplane trip. 500 miles, it's the same. And greater than 500 miles, you by filing signally coach class have a, a less of an economic impact than if you drove your car. That's the that's assuming that's assuming now that your car is the same gets the same gas mileage as the average American vehicle, fleet wide. Oh come on! I, I'm sorry. I can't. That's okay. Yeah, that's all. Sorry, but 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 the, but if you drive a car that gets forty five miles a gallon, you're in a different category. Okay, so that's just something to keep in mind. But air travel in general is very destructive. For example, Mary and I. Uh, produce about five tons of carbon dioxide between the two of us. I, I, that would actually would be double if I flew alone, if we took the same number of trips. But, but since we're on the same trip, it's, you know, so we produce about five tons a year. We're going to talk about uh, what we can do. Okay. okay. Well, yeah, and then we'll talk about barriers. Okay, thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Thank you, Alec. Appreciate it. Oh.